Welcome back, students. At this point, you may be asking yourselves questions like, what is the point of everything we have been doing in this class up until now? So why do we in the chemistry department think it's important for you to talk about things like quantization of energy uh, in terms of things like vibration and rotation and all other types of things that we've been talking about? Why are we doing this quantum mechanics stuff? Um, and it turns out that one of the main reasons for this comes down to spectroscopy. So in your previous chemistry classes, you have learned and used many types of spectroscopy. You've done things like IR spectroscopy, maybe UV vis, NMR, uh, and even we've seen X-ray spectroscopies. Um, and these techniques are very important and helpful to us as chemists. They allow us to distinguish between atoms and molecules. If you think about it, spectroscopy would not be possible if energy was not fundamentally quantized. One example that you're familiar with will be IR spectroscopy, and that allows us to distinguish between organic molecules like alcohols and ketones because the OH bond and the carbonyl bond are uh, different and are only capable of absorbing certain wavelengths of light. This is in general true for all bonds, which gives every molecule its own unique spectrum. If we think about this again, we can see that if that alcohol bond uh, for an alcohol was not quantized, if its vibrational levels weren't quantized, it would be able to absorb all wavelengths of light and it wouldn't give it its characteristic broad peak at around 3000 in per centimeter. So we couldn't distinguish it from other molecules. So we'll see how these quantizations in vibrational energy levels like we've been talking about uh, lead to differences in spectroscopy. And then we'll move on to include rotational uh, energy levels as well in the next lecture. So the learning goals for today are going to be, like we've already mentioned, to recognize the importance of quantization of energy for the application of spectroscopy. So for there, right, I already mentioned this. If energy was not quantized, every molecule would not give its own unique spectrum and we wouldn't be able to tell them apart using any type of spectroscopy. Uh, we'll use the Boltzmann distribution again. We've seen this a little bit before. We'll use it much more often now. And the Boltzmann distribution is going to be important because it's going to be able to tell us the amount of uh, molecules in each energy level, which will be important for spectroscopy. And then we'll look into selection rules, which are rules that govern which transitions are actually observable. And we'll want to explain those specifically for our harmonic oscillators. All right. So we'll ask this broad question here of what is spectroscopy? And of course, spectroscopy is a technique that is transitioning molecules between the different energy levels. Um, so spectroscopy takes advantage that there are energy levels and that there's a difference between them in atoms or molecules. Consider our harmonic oscillator example from last week. The difference between the energy levels for the harmonic oscillator was proportional to Planck's constant times nu, which was a specific constant based on the molecule. Therefore, these harmonic oscillators, which are bonds, can only absorb H nu worth of energy. They can't absorb H nu minus one or H nu plus three. And we'll look at interesting, the interesting case of two H nu, if it was going up two energy levels uh, later in this lecture. The same thing is in general true for all degrees of freedom. So, we also might be interested in this question of how spectroscopy works. And this is a pretty complex you know, question. Essentially what's happening is there's an energy level. So for example, we can talk about uh, vibrating maybe at the ground state and then vibrating at the excited state. And that has a difference of energy. If we hit molecules with uh, energy or light that has the energy equal to the, the transition here, we will see transition from the ground state to the excited state as that uh, these molecules actually absorb the energy from light. And we can see a similar thing for rotation as well. So the electromagnetic radiation coming from light is able to interact with molecules causing transitions between their energy levels. Now, the exact reasons for this are fairly complicated and are different based on the type of spectroscopy you're interested in. 
So for example, we'll see at the end of today's lecture that vibrational transitions re require what's called a dynamic dipole. So the dipole has to change as we go from one state to another, while uh, rotation requires a permanent dipole. So molecules that don't have uh, uh, dynamic dipoles or permanent dipoles won't be active under these types of spectroscopies. So since we need molecules with dipoles in order to absorb these kinds of light, molecules without them, such as homonuclear diatomic molecules, will not absorb uh, certain kinds of light. So for example, if we're talking about vibration, typically uh, infrared light is what's exciting tr uh, vibrational transitions. Um, so the fact that we need to have this uh, dynamic dipole to absorb infrared light means that molecules that don't have it, such as nitrogen and oxygen, will not absorb infrared light. Um, and uh, since nitrogen and oxygen are the main component of our atmosphere, they are not absorbing this infrared light, which lets a lot of the heat from the earth that comes off as infrared light escape. However, other molecules, including carbon dioxide and water, are not homonuclear diatomic. Therefore, they are infrared active and do absorb infrared light. And this is important in regulating the Earth's temperature. If we didn't have these molecules in the atmosphere, all of the infrared light uh, would leave and our planet would be cold, like Mars or the moon or something like that. But since we have them, it reflects a lot of the infrared light back down and we can get an increase in temperature. And this is the reason that these molecules like CO2 have been implicated in things like global warming. There are two main types of spectroscopy that we can do, and you've heard both of these words before. They're absorption spectroscopy and emission spectroscopy. Um, for the most part in this class, we are going to focus on uh, absorption spectroscopy, where molecules absorb certain wavelengths of light. So for that to happen, we have a molecule in a lower energy state that absorbs a wavelength of light and ends up at a higher energy state. Um, now, after this happens, these will emit their wavelengths of light and go back down to the ground state. And there's some interplay that can happen here, and we'll look into this in the future. But in the simplest case, these were going to be the same. So if we have, and this will be true for vibration, if we have a molecule in the ground vibrational state, it can be excited to a higher vibrational state, and then it can emit that and go back down to the ground vibrational state. And so in theory, both of these would be at the same wavelength. Now, the reason that we focus more on absorption than on emission is because uh, emission is a little bit harder to work with. So uh, in general, emission is spontaneous. So you can think about a light bulb and the light coming out of that light bulb is going in all directions, which makes it hard to sort of gather and quantize uh, in terms of spectroscopy. And that's called spontaneous emission. However, it's also possible to uh, get what's called stimulated emission, where you're shining light and that is encouraging molecules that are up in a higher energy level to emit light in the same direction in phase and go down to the ground state. Uh, now, this is a little bit harder to arrange, but uh, this is the source of things like lasers. So you can imagine a laser pointer that has light all in the same wavelength going in the same direction. And we'll talk about stimulated emission a little bit in the future of this class. Now, to understand spectroscopy, there are three pieces of information we need to know in order to interpret the spectra that we're going to get out. The first one of these is we need to know what energies we need to actually use in order to uh, accomplish the transition. We also need to know where the molecules are at the start of the experiment, and this will help us know where they're starting at, which will then help us determine what can happen as they actually transition upon absorbing light. And then three, this, is, this last point might seem a little weird, but we also need to know what transitions are allowed. And we'll look at this today, and we'll see that not all transitions are actually allowed. So to address the first question, we'll look at the molecule HCl. We're already familiar with this molecule from lab. Now, HCl has a constant here. And remember, this new constant is a pool based on its molecular constants, things like its reduced mass and the force constant of its bond, and change the units into inverse centimeters, the units that spectroscopy typically uses. If we ever want to convert from inverse centimeters to things like joules, we simply multiply by Planck's constant times the speed of light in inverse centimeters. 
So what happens to HCl as it vibrates? Well, we can calculate the transitional energy levels that would be involved by using the formula that we developed in the last chapter. So the energy of the vibrational energy levels is equal to Hc nu times n plus one half. Now this would get the energy in joules and I'll do that here, but again, often in spectroscopy, this Hc is left out and the energy is left in inverse centimeters and that's okay to do as well. So if we want to go to a transition from the ground state of zero to the first excited state, we simply have to plug in uh, one and zero for N. And we end up seeing that this is equal to HC nu, which would be 2991 inverse centimeters. To convert that to joules, we get a 5.94 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. Um, and that it corresponds to a wavelength of light about 3340 nanometers, which is in the infrared region. Uh, now, if we wanted to do rotation, we would do the same thing. We would go and grab our uh, quantization condition for rotational energy levels, which was h bar squared over 2i times LL plus 1. Just like for vibration, where these constants about the bond are pooled into this nu, here we have these pooled into this constant B. You can see an example for what B is here for HCO. Um, and then typically in uh, spectroscopy, to talk about rotational energy levels, we actually use a quantum number that's a capital J rather than a lowercase l. It means the same thing, but this helps us distinguish uh, L for specifically the orbital angular momentum. And we'll talk about that in the future. So we can calculate the transitions from the ground state to the first excited state. Um, and if we were to do this, we would get an energy that's equal to 2HCb, which would be again 2B uh, if we wanted to leave it in inverse centimeters or about 21 inverse centimeters. Uh, but this is 4.21 times 10 to the minus 22 joules, which corresponds to 472 micrometer light. Uh, now, if you look in the book, the book will tell you that rotational energy levels are excited by microwave light, and then the book will also tell you that 472 micrometer light is still infrared light. Um, so the, the point here is really that rotational energy levels are closer spaced than vibrational energy levels. So we can see that it's about two orders of magnitude here. And this is a general uh, trend is that all these different types of spectroscopy and these degrees of freedom are probed by different types of light. So we can use very low energy radio waves to probe the difference between nuclear spins and NMR. We can use microwave radiation to talk about uh, rotational degrees of freedom, uh, infrared light for vibrational, and then uh, ultraviolet invisible lights can get us electronic transitions. And we'll talk about all of these different types of spectroscopies as we go forward in class. So this addresses the first question of what kind of light we need. If we want to talk about a, a, a bond and we want to talk about vibrational energy levels, we need uh, infrared light. Now, the next question was, where are our molecules and where, where do they start and what's going to happen to them as we go through this process? So to address this question of how do we find the uh, population of energy levels, um, we need to turn to the Boltzmann distribution. I mentioned the Boltzmann distribution a little bit earlier on. Um, what the Boltzmann distribution is, is a way for us to look at the ratio of molecules, say in the ground state N0 to the first excited state N1. And what we need to do is uh, take this term here, these Gs are the uh, degeneracies. So for uh, for vibrational energy levels, these are going to be both one. The vibrational energy levels are not degenerate. For rotational energy levels, uh, that's not going to be the case. And we'll see that. And then we multiply the, dege the degeneracy term by E raised to the negative delta epsilon, which is the difference between the two energy levels uh, over K T. And so this ratio, we'll talk about this more next semester, but this is saying, how much energy does it take in this delta epsilon to get to the excited state? And then this KT is kind of like, how much energy do we have? So you can imagine if it takes a lot more energy than we have, we're not really going to be in the excited state very often. So we've already calculated delta E for vibration for HCl. We can go ahead and plug these numbers in. Uh, this 4.14 is KT at, uh, room, at room temperature. And we can see we get a value of e to the minus 
0.5, which if we evaluate that, we get 1.41 times 10 to the minus six. So for every molecule in the excited state, there's about a million molecules in the ground state. So our molecules are going to be almost exclusively in the ground state. Uh, this is good to know uh, because it will give us a, a solid starting point for vibrational spectroscopy. And it's also helpful because remember, our harmonic oscillator approximation is only good in the ground in the first excited state. So if almost all the molecules are in the ground state, a harmonic oscillator is actually a pretty good assumption. Uh, this is not true for all molecules, and we'll see this in a, in a minute here. Let's evaluate now rotational transitions. Uh, and rotational transitions actually are degenerate. Remember, the degeneracy is 2L or 2J in this case, plus 1. So the first excited state for rotation is threefold degenerate, where the ground state is non-degenerate. So this, this term here ends up being 3 over 1, which is 3. And then we calculated the delta U, uh, the delta E, sorry, from last time. And we can compare this to KT. We get 3E to the 0 0.1. We plug in these numbers and we get 3.32. So this shows us that there are in fact many rotational states occupied. And we can go through some math, and we'll probably see this on a homework assignment in the future, that will show us that the maximum uh, for HCl here is at J equals three. Now, this is different for our vibrational degrees of freedom, which are almost exclusively in the ground state. And we'll see the consequences of this on spectroscopy when we actually go and do this in the lab. So let's look at some degrees of freedom here. Again, this is specifically for vibration. We can see that the smaller the molecules, the more quantized the energy levels. Um, and this doesn't have HCl, but it has HH, HF, HBr. And we can see that as long as our molecules are pretty small, we're almost exclusively in the ground state here. Once we get to molecules made of larger atoms like uh, diatomic bromine, here we see that uh, the bond is weaker for these larger atoms, which is uh, shown by this reduced new constant here. And that gives a pretty substantial population of molecules in the excited state. So for bromine here, one out of every six molecules is in fact in the excited state. So it turns out that only certain transitions are allowed, and these transitions that are allowed vary by the technique. Now, the reason that only certain transitions are allowed is because transitions are something that's happening in real time. So we have to actually consider things like the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We're not going to go too far in here, so don't worry too much. We're going to look at some of these uh, at the, at the time-dependent Schrodinger equation and see what conclusions we can draw from this. So our time-dependent Schrodinger equation, remember, is simply our regular Schrodinger equation, uh, the time-independent version, uh, multiplied by this time-dependent term here. So what that's going to get us then is that our total wave function is equal to some uh, function in the ground state plus some function in the excited state. And we have these normalization constants that are A1 and A2. And here, these are actually, these constants are not constants, they're functions of time. Because at the beginning, before we do spectroscopy, all of our molecules are in the ground state. And then as the spectroscopy happens, we get some particles in the excited state. So this A1 and A2 actually changes with time. And of course, these numbers are just normalization uh, coefficients. And these uh, determine how likely we are to measure a molecule in the ground state here or the excited state here. So it turns out that for vibrational spectroscopy, the, the book in chapter uh, or in section 19.9 goes through this. I'm not super interested that you go through. You can have a look and if you want to, to see some of the math here. But we have this equation that our A2, which is our normalization coefficient as a function of time, is equal to a lot of nasty stuff. But what it's equal to is this mu x21 here, which is our transition dipole moment. So we can see that if this transition dipole moment is zero, then A2 as a function of time is zero. And what that means is that we'll never observe molecules in this excited state 
by absorbing things like infrared light. So when we say that things like homonuclear diatomic molecules are uh, vibrationally inactive or IR inactive, it means that when we try to probe them with IR spectroscopy, since their transition dipole moment here is zero, we'll never actually observe any transition. There is no transition. So if we want to see what transitions are allowed, we actually have to evaluate this transition dipole moment. And if it's ever zero, we know that corresponds to a transition that is not allowed. So how can we calculate this transition dipole moment? Um, it turns out that the transition dipole moment can be described by the following integral here. So here, we, instead of having two and one, we have arbitrary uh, indices M and N. So we're gonna be transitioning from N to M here. And to determine the transition dipole moment, what we need to do is evaluate the following integral, which, which looks a lot like our probability density. However, we're taking two different integrals or two different wave functions. So we have our psi n of x and we have psi star of m of x. And then in between there, we have this uh, term here that's the uh, dipole moment uh, operator. All right, so here we have our, our transition dipole moment operator. And what we're going to do is we're going to model the transition dipole here by using a Taylor series expansion. So we'll have the permanent dipole, which is the dipole equilibrium. That's what that XE means, the equilibrium bond length. And then we'll say we have some transition dipole here. And if we plug this expression for mu of X into our equation, we'll actually get a picture for what this transition dipole moment is. We'll also use what we noted earlier and state that for almost all vibrating molecules, the bond starts in the ground state of n equals zero. So what we're going to evaluate then is the transition dipole moment from some state m uh, or to some state m from state zero. This is then is going to be equal to the integral of psi m star x. Here we'll plug in our expression for the dipole moment where we have mu naught xe, which is a constant, plus x times d mu x dx at equilibrium, x equals zero, and then psi uh, zero of x. And with this, what we'll be able to do is split this into two integrals. So we'll have one integral that is uh, mu naught xe times the integral of psi m star x psi zero of x dx. And then we'll have another integral that is d mu x dx at x equals zero times the integral of psi m star x psi naught of x. All right, so why did we go through this process? Well, when we're integrating these, right, we're integrating over all the relevant space. So I'll go ahead and put these uh, negative infinity to infinity here. And we can notice a couple things. First, what we have here is the uh, integral of two different eigenfunctions uh, from the same set. Uh, over all space. And so we know since these eigenfunctions are orthogonal that this integral is always equal to zero. And so that's why for vibration, the permanent dipole or mu naught xe here doesn't matter because it ends up being multiplied by this term zero. Now, what about this guy? Well, here we have this x thrown in. So we don't just have uh, the product of two of our eigenfunctions. So we can't immediately say that this integral is zero. Um, so what is this integral? Well, it's going to depend on the transition. First, let's note what's going to happen if m is even. So if m is equal to something like 2, 4, 6, what's going to happen? Well, that would give us uh, that we have our d mu x dx at x equals 0 times a negative integral from infinity to uh, negative infinity. And let's just go ahead and put in a psi two of x here. What kind of function do we have? Well, here we have an even function. And here we have an even function. 
And here we have an odd function, our x. So that means that overall, our whole function is odd. And we're trying to evaluate the integral from negative infinity to infinity of an odd function. And you'll recall that our, one of our properties of our odd functions is that their integral from negative infinity to infinity is equal to zero. So our transition dipole moment is zero uh, if we're transitioning from a, a, a ground state of psi zero to psi two, four, six, et cetera. Our transition dipole is also zero if this dynamic dipole that's changing as a function of uh, exciting the vibrational transition is zero and then it's multiplied by this integral and it doesn't matter what the integral is, it's still zero. Now, what happens if our m is not an even number? So for the case of uh, m equals one, we would have the following. Again, we're just plugging in one for m here. And we would see that this integral is actually non-zero. So here, what we end up having is two odd functions. So psi one is an odd function, x is an odd function, and then psi naught is an even function. And here we end up having an even function. So we're going to have two times this whole integral from zero to infinity because our even functions are symmetric about the y-axis. So the integral of them from negative infinity to infinity is the same as them from uh, two times them from zero to infinity. And so that means that this transition is not zero. Now you might be noticing, well, this observation is going to be true if m is any odd number. So if m was three or five or seven or anything like that, we should also see an even function in a non-zero dipole moment. And you are half right. So interestingly enough, um, we actually do observe, of course, even functions, but all of those functions for m equals three, five, seven, and so forth are zero. They're even functions that end up having an integral equal to zero, and we'll see that on the slides. So here we can see examples of these integrals. Here is psi one, uh, when we use psi one and psi zero, and we see we have some area under this curve, but for psi three and psi five, we also have negative area under the curve, and at the end of the integral, it turns out that these are zero. So this area perfectly matches this area and we still get zero transition dipole moments. So that means that our net selection rule in order to observe a transition, the only way we can have a transition dipole moment that is non-zero is if we have a dynamic dipole. So this term here is not necessarily zero. And then we are transitioning from a uh, one state to a state that's one higher than it. And in most cases, that's going to be at psi zero to psi one, because almost all of our vibrating molecules start in the ground state. So here on the slides, I did it a little bit differently than I was doing it on the board, and I've broken this apart into the different components of the harmonic oscillator, but the same thing still holds. So we have our normalization constants out here and we have H instead of Psi, but these are still even and odd functions. All right, lastly, I want to point out that transitions corresponding to things that aren't Delta N equals one are possible. Now you might be angry because you just went through all this work showing that they are impossible and now I'm showing that, you, that they are possible. And this is of course because these vibrating molecules are not perfectly harmonic oscillators. If they were, these sorts of transitions would be impossible. However, they are not. Uh, and we can model this in a couple ways. We can of course use the Morse potential rather than the harmonic oscillator potential um, and show that this is not the case. Another thing we can do that's actually mathematically easier, and some of the examples in the book do this, is by treating our transition dipole as one with one more term. And we see that by treating, uh, if we treat our uh, transition dipole moment in this way, we can see things like overtone transitions that are allowed. And in one of our labs, I think it's gonna be lab six, we are going to attempt to see overtone transitions for the uh, IR spectroscopy of SO2, and we'll see that it's actually pretty hard uh, to go about doing that.
And with that, I'll finish here. We'll pick up next time with the discussion of actual spectroscopy. So we'll take these ideas that we developed this time in conjunction with the quantum mechanics that we developed last week and put those together to try to say, well, what's going to happen if we do IR spectroscopy on small molecules?